right, so I'm here to talk to you about a Swift language feature that um, I kind of like. I want to thank Dan Jalkut for giving me the, the inspiration to do this talk in the last like 20 minutes. Um, not really. Um, so uh, attributes, one of my favorite features of the Swift language um, is like protocols and generics, they get all the love. Uh, protocols got two WWDC design talks, everyone talks about generics, but not a lot gets said about attributes. Maybe a paragraph if you're, you're lucky. Now granted, you can't build your own stuff um, with attributes like you can with uh, protocols and generics, um, but I, I kind of like them. Okay, so you've seen them, you've written them, you've sprinkled them around your code. It's those things with the at signs. Uh, you can tag things. So like in this case, IB Outlet, we're telling uh, Xcode that this particular um, property uh, you can make a connection to in Interface Builder. It's kind of like putting a post-it note on your code that somewhere along the line, the compiler or Xcode or somebody can peel off that post-it note and say, OK, I need to do something special with this uh, code. In this case, UI application main is saying that this is the main class to instantiate when the application starts up. And uh, also at testable, it's a way of pulling in code to your unit tests so that you can access that API inside of your tests. So Swift has like one or two attributes at your disposal. Um, some of these are documented, uh, many are not, especially the ones with the underscores. But there's about 50 or 60 attributes uh, up here that you could put in your code and play with. So standard disclaimer, don't use undocumented features in production code, but for your own fun, your own tests, to show off to your local Cocoa heads, it's like, hey, I just discovered under, under fixed layout. Let's see what it does. Uh, that stuff is, is fun. So I like to bin attributes into just a couple of categories so that I can kind of keep them separate in my head. It's just my taxonomy, but feel free to adopt it if you wish. Um, so the first is like language features. No matter what platform, these will affect the semantics of your code. Things like discardable result. Your function returns something interesting but not vital, so it's okay for the caller to not assign it after uh, you call the function. That way they don't have to do an underscore to eat the result. Uh, escaping. Does this closure need more explicit memory management semantics because it's going to be stored in a property? Uh, no return. So it's like this function does not return ever. So things like exit, which terminates your program, you're going to go into it, you're not going to come out. Um, and then kind of obscure stuff, auto closure. Turn the first argument in a function into a closure. That's how things like assert is implemented. And then uh, at dynamic, to force dynamic method dispatch, actually going through obc message send, um, don't use Swift's default dispatch mechanism. And then there's interoperability for talking to the C and Objective-C sides of the world. No C++, sorry, but you can talk to C and Objective-C. So at obc, use Objective-C calling conventions for this function, and this implies at dynamic. Uh, as Dan Jow could mentioned, you can put in a selector name, and the Swift will use that selector when calling this particular method. Uh, obc members, if you want to do a blanket, everything in this class is going to be tagged with obc. And then kind of an under the hood one, convention, calling convention. This controls how the compiler arranges the bytes in registers and on the stack for uh, calling functions. It's like C, closure, thin, thick, all sorts of stuff. Uh, then there's undocumented stuff, like you know, semantics, uh, things that the optimizer can use to uh, improve its work. Transparent, controlling where inlining happens when uh, your, your code is compiled. And I love this one, unsafe no obc tagged pointer. It just sounds cool. Uh, it controls whether or not you can use certain Objective-C objects that have their pointer, and then they use different bits inside of that pointer for you know, a shorthand reference count or uh, other stuff. And then the things that are just like purely iOS. So the Linux people are not going to be seeing these guys. Like IB Outlet, make a connection. Xcode can look for this attribute and draw little circles and let you make connections. IB Actions, hook up a function that can be called from a button. Uh, available tag of a function so, or class so that you don't have to sprinkle availability checks inside of it. And then UI application main again, which uh, generates the boilerplate for launch, uh, launch time of your application. 
So in Objective-C, every app has a main.m file that contains something like this. It takes the command line arguments, makes an auto-release pool, UI application main, and you give it the name of two classes. One, a UI application class to use for connecting to the Windows server, essentially, and then the app delegate class. Uh, in Swift, they've replaced this with an attribute. So all you have to do is tag UI application main to your app delegate class, and then it is going to automatically generate that boilerplate for you. And it gives Apple a hook in the future to add things to the bootstrap if they want to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much it about attributes. There's a finite set of them, at least of the documented variety, and they're easy to work with. So I guess I have some time left. Um, so <laughs> when I first got into Swift and was using attributes and doing this stuff in the code, the first thing that pops into my head was, how does it work? And anybody who knows me, it's like, this is the first question that always pops into my head. It's like, hey, that's really cool. How does it work? Um, it's my favorite question ever. Uh, so, so much of my knowledge and my skill just comes from asking this question. And once you get an answer, then you can ask it again. Oh, okay, that's cool. How does that work? Okay, how does that work? And you can go down amazing rabbit holes. So, if you don't know how something works, you can find somebody and ask them how it works. You can go ask Uncle Google. Uncle Google knows just about everything. You can come to wonderful things like .swift and just marinate in the knowledge which comes forth. Um, but if you're on your own, you're trying to fix a bug, or it's like, I just put the kids to sleep, I got a couple hours, I just want to dig into stuff. So you can dig into it and figure it out for yourself. And so kind of like, what's the, the benefit of doing that? Well, I believe in self-sufficiency. If you have the skills to find your own answers, you can't be permanently blocked in your own work. So let's take a peek at how the compiler works on the inside. And trust me, this is going to relate back to attributes. So how the compiler works, but simplified. So we've got our source code. Uh, the source code is messy. It is created by humans. Uh, it's got you know, extra spaces. People argue about where the braces go. Comments, which have could have things inside of it which are completely non-parsable by regular expressions. Going from any kind of text representation is hard and ugly and nasty. So the folks have come up with this idea of the abstract syntax tree, or AST, a chunk of compiler. All it does is take the source code, throw out all the comments, take out the blank space, and say, oh, here is a func. Oh, here is an at blah. Here is a var. This thing looks like a variable name. This looks like a, a closure. So it can make a tree of nodes, which then can be passed on to other interested parties, such as the thing that generates the actual object code, which runs on the processor. So that way, all that stuff doesn't have to worry about text. Text is grody. Stay away from text. But abstract syntax trees, because I mean, it has three really cool words, abstract, syntax, and tree, so it has to be awesome. OK, so here's, here's some simple code. Um, so it's a UI view controller. It's been tagged with obc members. We've got a UI uh, switch outlet. We've got a property that has no annotations, uh, an action, and an observer, which takes a closure that's both an auto-closure and it's escaping. So a kind of like a kind of abstract syntax tree would look like this, like class at the top. It's a directed acyclic graph. So you've got your class. There's two properties, one for the outlet, one for the other property. You've got the two functions. One function takes one parameter. Other function takes two parameters. And so what happens with attributes is essentially like somebody with a rubber stamp goes and says, OK, chunk. Class, that one has been tagged with obc members chunk. Uh, the uh, IB outlet has that. So it's like adding little extra bits of information to the syntax tree which already exists. So it's like optional little uh, flags of information. So there's one for the IB action, and then two attributes for our fancy um, uh, closure. So since you'll be seeing this term in a little bit, uh, another application of the abstract syntax tree. So. You've got our source code. It's really nasty. Um, make an abstract syntax tree out of it. Then it goes to the LLVM IR. 
So LLVM, low-level low virtual machine, intermediate representation. That's just the magic inside of Clang and inside of Swift, where you can take your code, boil it down to essentially abstract assembly language, uh, create object code, and do a whole bunch of optimizations on that stuff. Swift is a great deal higher level language than C and Objective-C, so we've got the source code, and then it goes, makes the abstract syntax tree, then goes into the Swift intermediate language, which is halfway between the uh, IR and the abstract syntax tree, which then goes into the intermediate representation, which then goes to object code. So the compiler can apply the same optimizations that it does to the low-level code, but now there's this rich semantic soup available for optimizations um, using things like you know, more knowledge about the types, for instance, because Swift is all about types. OK, so now you know exactly how the compiler works on the inside. Um, how do you figure stuff out? So use the source loop. And if you're not named Luke, you can use the source also. In particular, you, uh, use the uh, compiler source. So each and every one of you, and I have no idea how many balconies we actually have, um, is qualified to pull down the compiler source and start poking around. Nobody is going to look at you funny if you're in your office alone looking at the Swift uh, source code. Um, like, ton of useful information. You don't need any specific skills. You just need some tools to, to dig around it. So, but. Mark D, compilers are scary, big, gigantic beasts, and they are. So disclaimer is like, I am not a compiler engineer. The college I graduated from in the American South, before some of you were even born, I bet, did not have a compiler design course. I've never had a compiler design course. Um, so everything has just been, I know, has just been the result of personal curiosity. So this is the compiler GitHub project. Uh, two things to look at. One is the great big green button to clone it. So go home and clone it. And then your next order of business is to go into the docs directory. Um, treasure trove of good stuff. There's some of it is, is historical and out of date, and some of it is like current and exciting, like directions the language is going. Most of it is, is aimed at compiler engineers, but there's enough interesting general knowledge in there that's just like, yeah, feed me. So, so here's like the docs directory, the first two files, ABI stability manifesto. Swift 5 is all about ABI stabil stability. And then arc optimization. Um, so like how automatic reference counting and optimization happens. So anytime optimization is mentioned, it's like, oh, I get so happy because that's my favorite topics. And Dan wanted me to warn you that there is a photo opportunity to come up, so you may want to get your cameras ready. because we're going to learn how to search the source, Luke, and everybody else who is not named Luke. So here's this list of attributes again. Did you believe me that this is accurate? Did you wonder where I found this list online that some other person made? As far as I know, there's no list online like this for easy grabbing. So I found it myself in the Swift source code. Um, it was U actually UI application main that did it to me. I think I know how this works, but am I right before I start speaking lies? So how does it actually do it? So the tool I used is an ancient Unix utility called Find. Um, it's on Mac, it's on Linux, it's everywhere. So CD to your Swift source code project. Find walks a directory hierarchy. Uh, visits every file and every directory uh, recursively. Where do you start? Well, start in the current directory. Let's limit the types of files to look at to actually files versus directories or symbolic links or devices. Let's do something. For every file, let's run a command, grep. So grep searches through text files looking for stuff. All right, so grep, look for this text. Where do you look for it? First bit of weirdness, two curly braces side by side. That means this is the file that is currently being visited by find. The next bit of weirdness is a backslash semicolon. So the exec command needs to be terminated by semicolon, and the backslash escapes it from the shell. And then once it's done that, we print out the name of the file that, that we found. And there's also three faster alternatives. Find is slow. These three guys, ack, ag the silver surfer, and rip rep are the uh, uh, faster alternatives. And this is the photo opportunity if you want to capture this command. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet it um, when I'm done. 
Okay, so here is, is a shell. I hope everybody can see it is a little bit on the small side. I do apologize. So I am looking for GK inspectable. That is a rather obscure attribute, and that could give me a chance of where to find things in the source code. So change my directory, find in the current directory. Um, I'm looking for type of file. And it's like, hey, Mark, can you type faster? You're really slow. Um, Dan did talk me out of doing a live demo of making sure that the Swift compiler was checked out on this thing. He said, no. Um, so we're going to exec grep, look for GK inspectable inside whatever is currently being visited, and then uh, hide the escape uh, semicolon from the shell and print. And then it's going to run, and it's actually going to, it took like a minute and a half to actually do this on my machine. So I edited it out, all that stuff. But what you're going to see is like sets of results and then the file name. So it's just going to chug through, find all sorts of goodies inside of the compiler. And then once everything uh, is found, the prompt is going to come back. So I'm running this inside of Emacs. So Emacs is an editor that can also run a shell inside of it. BBEdit and some other things can do it. I recommend using an old school editor like that so that you can keep a search history. And also, it's easy to open files from inside of it. So here's a file that was found. And above it is the stuff that was found. So things inside of like tests. And this is you know, complete decal attribute and print out TC declarations and whatnot. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. This file, test attributes.swift, there's a lot of great test files in there. So you can look and see how the test files are actually done. In this case, it's using the attribute and making sure it compiles. This one is expecting an error because it's putting in this attribute onto something that is not a property, trying to put it on a class. All right, and then scroll down a little bit more. I'm looking for things that are kind of interesting. This one has a, um, a cool name. It's not this one, it'll be the next one. Not that one, but the next one. Wow, what idiot made this thing? Um, <laughs> but looking at like the different test cases, uh, then this one, um, yes. So when the file gets opened, you'll notice that it has AST in the name. So this is an abstract syntax tree chunk of stuff. Um, this is the diagnostic SEMA. Defines diagnostics for, um, for the compiler. And this is the error, which is uh, if you have a G, uh, G, uh, uh, attribute error related to this will be there, as well as pretty much every other error inside of the compiler. So you can graze it and see all the different kinds of errors which are available to you. And then this next one is actually the mother load. When I found this one, AST adder.def, attribute.definitions or defines or something. Um, so Swift AST adder.def defines macros used for macro metaprogramming with attributes. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds so cool. So here is um, a decal attribute, GK inspectable uh, on a variable. And then here's IB outlet. So here is where all of the declarations are. And there's um, like maybe 100 of them, 110, 108 of them, of which 50 of them are actually available to uh, you as, as a developer. So I've hoped you've enjoyed this little tour of attributes. As you probably guessed, attributes were just an excuse to go diving into the compiler itself. And I really believe that undirected creative exploration is the gateway to deeper knowledge. Um, there's a ton of use useful information in the compiler source, and you don't need specific skills. You just need determination and enough tools, and find is sufficient to get you started. Thank you very much.